Great. Uh, thanks, Brent. I'll just uh, let me get up to some sort of uh, altitude here on the microphone. Um, I'm no longer a chemist. Uh, I disclaim that right. If I walked into a lab today, I'd be a safety violation as soon as I walked in. All of my manual dexterity has disappeared some years ago. Uh, so I'm going to uh, kindly decline uh, that, uh, uh, that, that description and uh, talk a little bit about emerging technology and uh, maybe some of the things that we see at Lux Research, um, some of the opportunities that uh, we think are out there from an emerging technology perspective, which is what we're tasked to do. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, I'm going to see if I can actually operate this mouse thing. How do we operate there? That way? That way? No. We'll do it that way. Okay. What is Alux Research and what do you do with it? Um, so we're tasked with looking for new business opportunities that revol revolve around the physical and life sciences. Uh, we've been around for about 10 years doing this. Um, it's looking at both the technical evaluation as well as the market evaluation for technology. So the fundamental premise is a technology does not make a difference unless it can get deployed. So you can invest all the money you want in some sort of technical aspiration. If no one uses it, it is pointless. Our job at Lux Research is to maximise the number of dollars that get invested in the best technologies that move the needle around the globe. We do that primarily on behalf of multinational corporations who are our clients, and we go looking for all of the most interesting startup companies and innovators around the world. We conduct between four and 5,000 interviews every year with innovators around the globe trying to uncover what are the best technologies that are out there. Um, we're global, our clients are global, and uh, most of our staff looks just like me. They have a technical background with some sort of business background on top. We believe it's easier to put business into someone with a technical background than technology into someone with a business background. That is our premise. That's why we exist. There is a list of technologies that we cover on the right-hand side there. I've got a simpler view of this um, that looks at a range of different emerging technology areas. The most important thing I will point out here is we're covering very big things, and we have no skin in the game we have no dog in the race, right? So there is traditional technology in here, there is emerging technology in here. We're looking at investing the dollars in the biggest challenges that are out there in energy and infrastructure and in health and wellness and in materials. So I have no agenda other than to reach out and, and speak to you about well, how we're going to make a difference. What do we do here? How do we move the needle? I'm going to do that with an agenda, thankfully. Uh, it's a relatively simple agenda. Um, there's a stark reality that I'll describe to you, um, somewhat stark. Um, there is a participation in that reality that is possible. And then there's um, staying in reality, which is how I'll conclude. You'll notice there is a theme warning here. Um, we've got to talk realistically, um, not aspirationally. We've got to talk pragmatically because, again, any technology we invest in that does not see the light of day is a wasted dollar. It's a wasted dollar from a technology that could make a difference. So. Let's get started. A stark reality. A stark reality, we have a warming planet and a projected sea level rise that I think everyone is well and truly familiar with. Um, I was born in New Zealand. We know what it's like to be an island nation. I come from Christchurch, a very flat place. That is probably at risk as the sea level rises. So I'm with you, all right? I'm, I'm on the same page. I'm not taking a sort of a, a very sort of uh, I'm above this type of perspective. No, I'm right there with you. But there's a problem here, right? and we can project it out, it's predictable. If you put this up um, and said, would you buy into the stock at the time when something is rising up like that, you would absolutely buy into the stock. The sea level is going to rise, the globe is, the climate is going to warm. That is just a reality. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And how can we mitigate the problem? Well, we've got a big problem to mitigate to start with. I mean, these are the types of numbers that climate change and sea level rise are causing. Hurricane Sandy, 68 billion. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan, um, 10 billion and counting. Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, $125 billion of damage. This is pretty significant numbers, right? Remarkable numbers. You would think that we would do something about this, that now is the time. In fact, Copenhagen, 2009, I think it was Ban Ki-moon said, it is a now or never moment in Copenhagen. Well, I guess that means it's never. Right? But is it really? Is it really? Can we move the needle? Can we make a change here? Are these numbers big enough to make a change? Well, maybe, maybe not. 
I mean, this is, this is just going to keep going. This is uh, information from a study by the World Bank looking at the amount of average loss of GDP in different cities around the world. There are some cities that are already between about you know, a quarter of a percent and one percent of GDP loss every single year because of climate change or because of sea level rise. All right? So it's not just a unique problem to a couple of places in North America and in Hyann and maybe some other places around. This is global. Right? It's a global problem. Again, is this enough to move the needle? Change your pace. Here's a picture for you. Something interesting going on in this picture. What is the most disturbing thing in this picture to everyone that's looking at it? I'll give you a hint. It's not the scary person. It's the milkshake. It's the milkshake because no matter how much danger this individual feels right now, no matter how imminent the risk to this person's survival, they do not give up what they love. They carry the milkshake until they die, <laughs> right? So the theory is, do not, do not under any circumstances drop the milkshake. We will retain dearly anything that we're used to and anything that we love, and that is human nature. That is just our human nature. We're incredibly resistive to change. You think it's silly. You think it's hard to let go. You think it's hard to look at stupidity in the eye and not keep doing it. I'll show you some examples. Um, this is a quote. It, I live in the US. I live in Boston, in case you're trying to pick the accent, you know, obviously New Zealand, but I'm in, in the US. I reserve the right to point and laugh at Americans still. Uh, I've been there for 18 years, but I reserve that right. Here's a quote from uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, um, Senator for Rhode Island. Um, even though North Carolina scientists predict 39 inches of sea level rise within a century, by its own law, North Carolina cannot design for any more than eight inches of sea level rise. Right? We know this is going to happen, and yet we keep on doing the same stupid things. They're not, they're not alone. The US federal government has rebuilt the infrastructure 12 times since 1979 in this island in Alabama. 12 times. Not learning, not changing. Um, tax money for New York, post Sandy, will go into building it exactly the way it was. Exactly the way it was. And this is a reality. This is what we're dealing with. This is so much a reality, and we look at emerging technology, and we're helping large companies make money. This is so much a reality that we're now sizing the market for seawall construction. We actually look at seawall construction as an emerging technology. This is going to grow from about, what, f what have we got, 4,000 what, $4 billion in seawall construction? That's going to grow. It's going to more than double by the time we hit 2023. All right, it's a reality. Deal with it. So if you've got technology, if you're a material scientist, by all means, geosynthetic fibers and geosynthetic materials that go into seawalls, there's money to be made here. But it's a reality, right? Again, emerging technology that's going to move the needle in a way that's going to prevent damage. This is one of the outcomes. One of the outcomes here is not to prevent the problem. One of the outcomes is we've got to realize this is the reality of the problem and deal with it, adjust. It's human nature. The lesson in human nature, we will do basically a lot of things not to change. In fact, we will spend more money not to change. We will more than double our spend on seawall construction instead of looking at the cause of what drives a lot of the seawall construction. Our job, our human nature, is to resist change and to actually pay more money for that outcome. We've got to think about this from an energy perspective. How do we play into this? Well, I've got examples as to how we spend more money to resist change. So this is the production, so capital expenditures per barrel of oil produced over time. So I apologize for the, uh, for the small numbers here. From 1998 to 2011 are the numbers we're looking at. Left-hand axis, that is the production. On the right-hand axis, that is the EMP capex spend per billion barrels. We keep spending more and more money not to change, right? That is the decision we're making, and it's a tremendous amount of investment going on. This is reality, right? And again, stark reality pragmatic reality. So we know that. We know we've got to actually replace reserves. There's a lot of complexity in here. The one thing I'll point out there, the highest dotted line there, that is the OPEC quote for reserves. They are massively overestimating and overstating their reserves because OPEC, you know, the, the way the rules there, 
the rules work. The higher your reserves, the more, you, you're, the more you're allowed to produce. Standard OPEC rules. We estimate they're overestimating. We think they're overestimating by about 70%. If the reserves for oil and gas are replaced at historic rates at 1.4%, which is the historic replacement rates for oil, we will run out of oil in 2040 at the current increase in demand and at the current recovery rates that have, and at the current increase in rates of, uh, of reserves that are out there. That is a loss of milkshake moment. So there's a point in time where we've got to look at this and go, what are we going to do? There's a milkshake out there and I've got to keep getting my milkshake. Well, thank goodness, we've got unconventionals. Truckloads of them. Truckloads. And we've, we've talked about that already today. I think everyone's kind of beaten that over the head. And rightly so. There is a lot of unconventional fossil fuel that is available, that is extractable. Not all of it is extractable. Some of it is expensive. But I've already shown you how we will spend phenomenal amounts of money to extract that fossil fuel in order to not let go of the milkshake that is most familiar. That is what we do. Now this is global too, so if you want to talk about energy security, oh, this is great. Everyone's a winner. It's fantastic, right? Why do we want to change? Why do we want to drop the milkshake? Well, shale gas is a big part of this as well. So again, spread widely throughout the globe. So the US is certainly leading. They've been first horse into the race, but this is everywhere. So you know, there's a lot of discussion about, well, what should British Columbia do? Should you, know, should you really ex you know, take on this shale gas resource and this gas resource you're sitting on? Oh, I don't know. That's not my job to tell you the policy of the, po of the province. I'm just here for a few cold truths. But everyone's going to participate in this. This is not just a US situation, and it's not just a China situation. This is everywhere. So what's the impact? So we know shale's huge. You know, oil and gas running out, unconventional to replacing it, shale a big part of that. Well, problem is renewables are sitting out there. So we've, we've got people in the audience, and I think Richard from the uh, Climate Exchange, Carbon Exchange, he'll, he'll tell you about how we can have a renewables future. Well, this is pretty tough to sell, right? Because the levelised cost of electricity for solar at the utility scale, and this is looking somewhat at, the, at a blended US rate, the levelised cost of electricity does not add up. And when we can't ask consumers, it's very difficult to ask consumers to adopt this extra cost, to suck it up and to pay for this. So we've got a gap. We've got a gap and that solar is not cheap enough. The gap's closing and that's important. We're actually going to come back to that. Um, we could look at the battery market. Look at energy storage, both in the mobile sense. You can look at energy storage from a, a stationary grid storage perspective. Well, there have been some problems there too. I can show you a whole litany of accidents in different stationary grid storage deployments and different projects that have caused, basically caused a stall to many of the projects that are out there. So here are the numbers. Here is the installed capacity of grid-scale energy storage by technology. Flow batteries, flywheels, lead acid, lithium ion, molten salt. That basically levelled out in 2013. There were no new deployments. Two reasons, safety and cost. It didn't make sense to keep going. So utilities are basically stopped. The only exception to this is going to be the rules that have come out of the CPUC recently demanding that a certain amount of energy storage actually goes into place. The only way to change this is to legislate, but there's really no driver to keep adopting this technology. Safety and cost don't add up. Electric vehicles, well, we can talk about that as well. Yeah, I don't know how long I want to talk about it. Um, that's a truckload of money for a truckload of disappointment on a global basis. On a global basis, there are reasons for this. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to why this is the case. And there are things that we can do about it, right? I'm, I'm painting a dismal picture here. It's kind of the pattern. I'm taking you through a fairy tale of once upon a time. And at some point in the fairy tale, I'm going to put the main character in just hor in a horrendous situation. And then we'll show you the path to happy joy. OK, so that's the story. Pretty horrendous. Lots of money down the gurg, lots of uh, politicization of the issue. Eh, you could argue rightly so. So here's where we end up. A few things that are out of control. Hydrocarbons, good to buy peak oil. Hello, bottomless unconventionals. Climate change, deal with it. Deal with it. Adjust to it and figure out what the reality is and how we adjust to reality. Hey, we'll have more time to, and a little more space for sailing, right? A little more, little more water area, a little more time off from the, uh, the loss of economic value from the shutdown of businesses. Great, sailing, awesome. Um, alternative energy, slow adoption, right? But th so this is the reality. 
This is where we are today. Question is, what do we do? How do we participate in this? How do we can take control of this situation? Realizing how resistant the human condition is to change. And remember that, we are all incredibly resistant to change. And there's no more resistance to change in the in than in the energy sector. It is big, it is slow, it is monolithic, it is tough to move the needle. Apologies to anyone who's worked in the utility sector. Aaron, I can't see you. Um, participating in reality. Here's a simple look at human nature. We're human, we're programmed to assess the size and the imminence of threat. So I can tell you about global warming and the implications for 2050. We don't care. We don't care. 2050? Ah, we'll worry about that tomorrow. What do we do about today? How do I get better today? We're designed to survive and we're designed to assess the imminence of a threat and then react. So at the top left here, if I have a feeling that I'm going to lose my milkshake, if something has to change, I will react at that point in time. The more I go down this curve, the further out the implication of the threat comes, the less I think about how do I change, and the more I think about, oops, sorry, the more I think about other things. So let's look at what drives imminent threat. How, how much can big things move when there's this imminent threat? Let me tell you, tell you about Israel's water crisis. I mean, water is about as big, slow, and monolithic as the energy business when it comes down to it. So what happened in Israel? They approached, quote unquote, the black line, or they assessed that they were approaching a black line in 2009. They were going to lose their milkshake. And bear in mind, this is water. This is not energy we're talking about. You will, you will not find energy anywhere on Maslow's pyramid, or at least in the bottom level. You will find water in Maslow's pyramid. This is an imminent threat to survival. What happens? Well, you overhaul the entire water supply and infrastructure system in three years. Three years! Find me an energy system that has changed with that sort of speed. It just doesn't exist, but we've got to find some other way to participate. And what, did they, what exactly did they do? Well, they installed 600 million metres cubed, cubic metres of seawater desalination. That ain't cheap. That is not cheap, and they had to install a whole bunch of infrastructure on top, so they will change when they want to. And, and invested 550 million to rewrite the infrastructure. And it was all driven by one thing, the need to survival was great enough and immediate enough to drive change. That is not energy. That is not energy. Energy has to play differently in this space. There is no dropping of the milkshake in the next three years to cause a substantial change in behaviour. There's just not. So we've got to find some other, some other thing to do, some other way to behave. The more we go down this curve, the more we think less about losing our milkshake, and the more we think about, give me some more milkshake. That's what I want. Give me more milkshake. Because the human condition, once we move past the need for survival, once we feel safe in our existence, the next thing we're designed to do over millennia, the next thing we're designed to do is to grow and improve our position versus someone next door. We become competitive once we know we can survive. That is human nature. So how do we become competitive? What are the angles we can play in order to present the case in energy, because it ain't a drop milkshake, to present the case in energy to allow us to grow more, to deliver more milkshake, because that is what we're tasked to do, that is what we're asked to do, that is what we're designed to do. So we're going to try and hold on a little bit longer. Here's what we're going to do. Oops. How do we change? How do we, you know, how do we drive this thing you know, and drive change when we're desperately trying not to? How do we sneak it in? We're essentially having to sneak in change in some way, shape or form. What are the ways that we can really change the picture here? Well, there's a bunch of things we can do. The most important thing, and this is a vast oversimplification, there's a big candy store of different causes and factors and things we could talk about. And there's all these different technologies. You've seen the things that we cover at Lux Research. So there's a lot of stuff going on there, right? I, geez, I could, I, could, I could talk for a day. You don't want to listen to that. So here are four basic things. The first and most important thing that plays into the human condition, find innovations that first and foremost minimise disruption. That minimise disruption to who we are because when it comes down to it, we actually don't like to be disrupted. We want to hold the milkshake and we will hold on to it dearly and if we can hold on to it, then we want more milkshake. So minimise disruption, once we're at that point, the milkshake is safe, we're good with that. 
then it's about more milkshake, maximizing efficiency, reducing cost. There's the extra thing in here though, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this later, this idea of leveraging disconnects that can occur as a result of the decisions we make to hold on to the milkshake. There are new opportunities that emerge because of decisions we make, and that's where money can also be made. And actually money that's very specific to this province. I'm gonna take you to that. But, let's start with minimizing disruption. What do we need to do? Feed the gravy train when it comes down to it. Environmental health and safety is the biggest concern and the biggest thing that will slow down unconventional fossil fuels over time. And there's actually a lot of investment going into this. Oil and gas companies, they are dying to avoid headlines. The worst thing for this industry, whether it's conventional or unconventional fossil fuels, is an accident. It's the biggest thing that'll slow down the gravy train. And they're, they're actually investing a lot in this. So they've actually improved over time because they have to. And they're investing a lot in it. Again, the numbers are small here. Hopefully you can see those. Between, we're projecting between, what, 2012 and uh, 2030. Uh, we're seeing spending in HSE for oil and gas going from about 35 billion to almost, well, almost double that. Close to double that. 60 billion spent on HSE technology deployment. How do we keep the gravy train moving? And when you think about it, this is a good thing for the environment. So people are, everyone's saying, what? This is carbon. How can carbon be good for the environment? Well, carbon that's not spilt is a whole bunch better for the environment than carbon you do spill. Realize the reality, we'll hold on to the milkshake. Let's make the milkshake first and foremost as safe as possible because that is what we're designed to do and nothing is gonna change that, nothing. So what do we need to do? What are the technologies that are out there? Well, there are a whole bunch of startup companies. So as I said, we conduct four to 5,000 interviews every single year with startup companies who are developing innovative technology for different areas. One of those areas, the HSC area for oil and gas. There's a whole bunch of different companies on here. This is just a small selection of companies that are out there, but the example technology we're looking at. Airborne sensors based on satellite technology to detect leaks, to rapidly detect and deal with leaks. Um, efficient natural gas compressors, and this came from an MIT pro M MBA project, driving efficiency into this process. How do we keep this going? How do we make it safer? Um, a plastic cap that stops oil spills. Again, this is part of saving the environment is not just about carbon, it's not just about the emissions. It's about not having mistakes that cause catastrophic failure to the environment. And furthermore, this plays into our human nature to hold on to that milkshake. We're not done. There are freight water treatment markets out there, plenty of startup companies in the space. In fact, this is probably a vastly over-invested space. So anytime you get a venture capitalist or a group of venture capitalists involved in something, guaranteed that will become an overhyped over market in a heartbeat. They can be great and they can be horrendous for deploying money in the right ways. This is one area where everyone rushed in. The problem with most of these companies, you can see we have a lux take on every single company we have, that's the color coding. Everything from a strong positive to the, um, the strong caution, which we love to give out once in a while. This is our take on the company in terms of their technology, their potential, and whether they are a valid investment and have a chance of success. There's a whole lot of wait and see and a good amount of caution here. There's not a lot on this top right in terms of both business execution and in terms of technology value. Why? Because most of these companies in here do not understand the complexity of dealing from water, of water and produce water coming out of those holes. Every single hole is different and most of these companies don't realise it. There are some exceptions. Aquatec, Croft, they know what they're doing. But the biggest thing here, and I can see people, you know, probably some people thinking it. Yeah, but it's water, right? It, it, how can you talk about water use as being sustainable we, we need that water for something else, right? And the water failures that might exist could be a bad thing. Well, there are other approaches out here as well. There are other technologies that can drive and optimize fracking and make them position to succeed. I'll draw you to the top right hand dot there, which is rated just about as high as we can put it, or as high on this, uh, on this two by two in terms of technical value, and pretty strong in terms of business execution. A company called gas frack. What does gas frack do? Waterless fracking. So they're using propane as the fracking agent rather than water. This is relatively deployed technology already. They're all running at about 50 to 60 million dollars in revenue. They've been validated by the Chevrons, the Shells. Process requires fewer truck rolls, 
which means we're taking efficient, putting efficiency into this system. It takes water out of the process. And this is a technology, this is a technology that brings value, brings efficiency, and does not disrupt. It will minimize disruption for an industry that desperately does not want to be disrupted. So this is one technology and the type of thinking of what can we do as innovators to make it better than where we are today based on a valid and a pragmatic assessment of reality rather than an aspirational assessment of reality. This is one of the things we can look at. Um, we know disruption is actually pretty important in the energy space anyway. You know, we, we get pretty annoyed at power cuts. I mean, utilities are essentially tasked with reliable provision of electricity. That's what they're tasked to do. Pretty annoyed when they don't do it. So we know that in the energy space, this idea of minimizing disruption is already fundamental to running the business. And this applies not only at the utility level, this applies at the consumer level. That's why things like uninterrupted power supply and backup power have been technologies and deployed technologies for a long time and actually in a lot of areas that are pretty important, medical, commercial, data centers, residential, industrial, telecom, these are sizable markets. This is 806 megawatts of market in this space. The interesting part of this, for technology developers that are out there, this is also going through a transition. This has been driven by lead acid batteries and by diesel gen sets and by very traditional technologies. This is going through a substantial transition right now where we're going from um, going from these very traditional systems into things like lithium-ion batteries, into some NICAD, which is still traditional but functional, and also some sodium nickel chloride, molten salt batteries, primarily from the GEs of the world. But you can look at lithium-ion batteries, or a lithium-ion battery producer should look at this space as being an area where an innovative technology and a new technology can be deployed based on the fact that it minimizes disruption. So this should be part of every multi-generational product plan, every multi-generational business plan for every single lithium ion developer that is out there. You can go and chase all the electric vehicles you want, and I'll show you some numbers on why that may or may not make sense. But this is a place where I can show you a market that exists and show you a market that will adopt because it minimizes disruption and because it makes sense to adopt emerging technology. Um, this idea of reliability and safety are, are, are keys to a market. Um, but even in this space, even in this data center backup and even this uh, um, uninterrupted power supply, there is still innovation required even at the lithium ion battery level. So we've spent a lot of time and the material scientists have spent a lot of time optimizing at the cell level, looking at the materials, cathode, anode, electrolyte, um, making these systems robust. What's been ignored in a lot of these systems and what is driving the reliability of these systems down substantially is there's been an absence of innovation or meaningful innovation in a number of other areas. The battery, man battery management systems are lacking. That's what's driving the state of charge windows down. Power conditioning systems are required that are specific to some of these, uh, some of these operations. Inverters, a tremendous amount of opportunity in the inverter space, particularly when you look at next generation diodes and transistors that use gallium nitride or silicon carbide. This is the level of innovation we should be thinking about rather than these aspirational grandiose visions of what the future is now we need to set a path with incremental innovations that get there. And again, I'm going to take you back to that. Um, so that's the consumer industrial space. What about consumers? Oh, consumers are just a fickle crowd. But don't ask them to pay more money. Certainly don't ask them to be disrupted. The story of the solar panels on the roof is classic of that. You're, being you're going to put panels on my roof? You're going to penetrate my roof with you know, some screws and do some crazy things? No, I ain't touching that. You can't tell me about economic value when you're going to disrupt something that I'm very much used to. But consumers will do crazy things for fear. So this is an example that will probably be familiar, might be familiar to one person in the audience. Let's look at uh, fuel cells in residential markets. We can take a, a random set, so we'll call them developers A through Y, might have a, a producing at high volume, you know, capex of the system, less than a buck a, buck a watt, you know, that's pretty standard. Uh, cost, you know, make, let's, say, let's say eight cents a kilowatt hour, looks pretty good, right? Okay, it's, it's pretty standard stuff for a fuel cell. Let's look at uh, developer Z, Z, depending on where you're from. Um, low volume, greater than $30 a watt, 1.3 kilowatt hours before, um, dollars per kilowatt hour before the fuel. And you're like, okay, this is a no-brainer. 
you're telling me which one of these companies or which one of these groups is actually doing better? Well, we got on one side, we've got uh, 50 million total. On the other side, we've got 600 million total. All right, what's going on here? What sort of market are we dealing with in this situation where something that patently makes no sense whatsoever is making a truckload of money? Well, as it turns out, Fukushima can do strange things to a consumer. So Panasonic capitalized on what amounts to irrational consumer behavior, primarily because the consumers who were affluent had enough money that they were scared of not having power if another outage occurred. So in Japan, we saw this situation where the payback period for this system, for this Panasonic fuel cell system, was 30 plus years. We were looking at only a 10 year warranty. Okay, do the math. 30 plus year payback, 10 year warranty, and yet this drove a tremendous amount of business because Fukushima changed the needs for the residential customer. It became a milkshake. And it became a milkshake that was disappearing. And so part of the job of business development people for startup companies wherever you are in the world is to identify where fear and where disruption are going to be important and are imminent because you can drive in some really ridiculous costs into that provider you develop the channels and you are first to identify that market. There's a false premise out there that technology is actually, the, if you give me a startup company with great technology, they'll be a winner. You show me a startup company with a great business model and I'll show you a much higher chance of success than a company with a great technology. That goes against a lot of conventional wisdom that might be out there, particularly folks that are responsible for funding innovation. They look at the technology first and the business model later. Kind of backward. Actually, very backward. But fear outweighed financial concern. They made entirely rational decisions because the milkshake was disappearing. And that's what drove decisions here at the consumer level. So we know that minimizing disruption at whatever level, at the big level, oil and gas and unconventionals, at the consumer and industrial level, at the residential level, at the, at the you know, individual consumer level, you can drive a lot of irrationality and get irrational decisions on the basis of minimizing disruption. What about these other things? Ah, it's roll. Let's get into this. Transportation. I thought it'd be rude not to talk about transportation. I mentioned electric vehicles uh, at one point. Here is um, our projection for what the automotive fleet is going to look like. And, and this is the passenger automotive fleet primarily. Um, here's what we see. Moving from, what, 2013 up to 2018. If you think the internal combustion engine is going anywhere, you are mistaken. I am sorry. But the most important thing in here, yeah, you can look at the, the small numbers around very traditional, uh, very traditional um, sort of electric vehicles. You know, what are we at? Like less than three percent penetration if you take HEVs, PHEVs, EVs, fuel cell vehicles, and mile hybrids all together, less than three percent. The biggest mover in here is actually micro hybrids. Micro hybrids moved in a very quick order, very quick period of time into something pretty remarkable. Well, why is that? Well, they're using a lot of technology that was already pretty well known. Actually, the, the vast majority of this technology that was being deployed is actually lead acid batteries. It's advanced lead acid, either fl um, flooded batteries or it, uh, absorbed glass mat batteries. But there's some other technology out there as well. Uh, interesting though, right? Because we didn't really talk about micro hybrids when it comes to funding and it doesn't get a lot of talk, it doesn't get a lot of play, we all like to talk about uh, really big stuff. Full electric vehicles, give me another Tesla. I'll pay $70,000, it's all good, right? I got money coming out my ears. It doesn't work like that. And in fact, even at $200 a barrel, even at historically high oil prices, you're still looking at pretty tepid penetration of the electric vehicle space aside from traditional hybrid electric vehicles. The reason for that, micro hybrids, mild hybrids, and HEVs minimize disruption for the consumer and they minimize cost for the consumer. Let's look at some numbers in there. So let's take a Ford Fusion 23, 23H, Chevrolet Cruze, you can see the numbers there. All right, let's, let's drill this down. Micro hybrid adds about $300 to the cost of the system. $300, you can get, depending on what level of hybridization you're looking at, you can get anywhere between 5 and 15% extra fuel efficiency out of mild and micro hybridization. 300 bucks, 5 to 15% efficiency, no disruption to the consumer. That gets adopted. That's easy. Hybrids, oh, it's a little more expensive. The fuel efficiency is, is good enough 
particularly once you go to those higher higher oil prices. Once you get into these light, um, the, the lighter plug-in hybrids where you're putting more battery on board, that battery, that's super expensive stuff. You're asking the consumer to absorb a lot of cost. Uh, but speaking of a lot of cost, what are we going to do here? We've got uh, Chevy Volt running at uh, about an extra 21. We've got a Nissan Leaf running at about an extra 14. Oh, and the champion of them all, $70,000. Give or take, I know there are three models out there and you can walk through that. As you heard yesterday that uh, Vancouver has the, what, the highest Tesla count per head of population of any place in the world. That just means you've got a lot of money. Uh, more money than cents, um, I could argue, but that's a different story. Um, but look at these numbers. There's a reason why one of these types of vehicles gets adopted. It minimises disruption and it makes sense from an economic perspective. Now, you could argue that from a an, um, sort of emerging technology perspective, this is problematic, right? So I'm, an, I'm a lithium-ion battery producer. Oh, great, so there's nothing there for me. There's, there's no volume at all on the electric vehicle space. But let's compare these two numbers, right? Um, Apple sold uh, almost 48 million iPhones in the first quarter of 2013, compared to only 4,900 Teslas in the same period of time. But if you do a calculation on how much energy storage was involved in each of these systems, 270 megawatt hours across all those iPhones, 400 megawatt hours across all of those, uh, all of those Teslas. So you might sit back and think, oh, this is terrible. You know, the transportation system is not changing at all. We're we getting this, these incremental improvements. For a battery manufacturer, this is actually pretty good. Teslas turn Panasonic profitable because Panasonic is the battery supplier. So before you, you know, start crying in your beer about battery developers, this is not bad. But remember, the automotive fleet is big and it doesn't like to be disrupted and neither do we as consumers, primarily. Now, we can project this out. There are going to be new types of systems that are out there. And you can actually see that in the transportation space, energy storage is going to grow overall to be oh, around about uh, 30, 35% of the overall energy storage market. So all is not lost. There's a, there's a truckload of money to be made here. But it's not going to change the entire automotive fleet. The ICE is here for a long time. We'd be better off looking at technologies that improve efficiency of the ICE. There are further technologies that are out there. Again, this is kind of small. This is our roadmap for emerging technology. So we'll see solid state, we'll see lithium sulfur. We will see technology that is innovative get adopted, but it's going to take a long time. We are well past 2020 before any of these customer types adopts the next generation of technology. Just set expectations and be realistic. That is the most important thing. It doesn't mean don't innovate. It does mean be realistic on the innovation and the timelines that you put out there for your investors, for your board, for your policymakers, whatever it is. Realism is the biggest thing that's lacking in this space. So what are the innovations we can put in place? Well, let's take a cue from what's happened in the mild hybrid space. What's an interesting technology that we've seen recently that helps drive efficiency in a system without driving disruption? Well, most interesting thing I've seen, re think, most interesting thing I've seen recently, a company called Peloton, seven-person startup company working on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure technology that allows drivers, truck drivers, to platoon vehicles. So in a country that does a lot of truck miles, and someone told me before I stepped in here today that Canada does a lot of truck miles, right? This is an interesting technology. How does it work? Well, it claims more than 10% fuel costs and reduced accidents. And the way it works is you can basically platoon these trucks. You can put them behind each other to drive efficiency not only in the truck that trails, but you can actually drive efficiency in the truck that's in the lead. I, I have to apologise. I was in North Carolina for two years. I did learn a little bit about NASCAR. It holds up, right? So we're waiting and seeing what this company is because there's a lot of business models and adoption that's got to occur here. But you're looking at substantial fuel savings with very little disruption for the user an actual payback for the user. This is the type of innovation that is incremental, minimizes disruption, and delivers value in terms of efficiency and in terms of cost. So we've done a lot of stuff here, and I think I've probably got about five minutes to go. Probably. Yeah, so I'm gonna roll through this pretty fast. What I wanna do is show some opportunities in here in terms of how shale is actually a good thing for sustainability if we play it pragmatically. Right? 
Shale is a good thing, and I know some people want to hit me right now because that's just blasphemy, right? Can't be. Can be. Right? So we're going to look at maximizing efficiency, reducing cost, and leveraging the disconnects that shale creates to actually drive an improved sustainability position. Here's some busy, busy data, but basically what this is saying is there are certain parts of the world where natural gas prices are going to drop, and there are certain parts of the world where natural gas prices are going to increase marginally. I'm not going to belabor this point. Other people have done a perfectly adequate job of talking about the uh, sort of the cross trade and the pricing implications of natural gas. But one of the things that happens in here is natural gas will hit a sort of a, a plateau. There's a certain point where you just can't strip any more cost out of the system. So it's a question of what implications it has for something like renewables. And we did this calculation. So we looked at what the projected natural gas prices are, even with shale gas, even with all this trade factored in. And then we looked at the projected prices for solar technology because we are a long way from done with bringing more efficiency into photovoltaic systems, both at the module level and also at the balance of systems level. What we found was in, in 2025, in a likely gas price scenario, solar can be competitive in the vast majority of geographies around the world. It can still be competitive. In actual fact, solar can benefit from natural gas. Let me show you how. As it turns out, natural gas is more responsive. It's more time responsive as an energy source than a lot of the traditional fossil fuels that are used out there. As a result of its responsiveness for time, it can handle intermittency from renewables a lot more effectively than the traditional systems we have and can handle it a lot more cheaply than any stationary energy storage we might choose to couple with solar today. Natural gas is a smarter, more economic decision than energy storage. And what you're seeing here is you can increase the ceiling, the intermittency ceiling, the adoption ceiling from you know, maybe 20% within a given grid. You can climb as high as, what, 40 45% depending on what type of gas turbine system you use. So for a combined cycle, it's a little bit lower, the responsiveness is lower. Um, but if we're looking at all gas combustion turbines, we can go as high as 45% renewable adoption and solar adoption because we're adopting natural gas. We don't make this decision. We're looking at entirely less feasible decisions for more renewable adoption. Think about that. The milkshake is helping us out. And there are systems already designed to do this. So this combined cycle idea combines uh, concentrated solar power with a gas turbine within a, natural gas, within a natural gas facility to get more efficiency and use larger turbines and drive them at higher cycles and higher utility rates. So we can combine these two systems, solar and natural gas, to deliver more value to the consumer and deliver cheaper power to the consumer, still integrating solar at the distributed level, which is where most solar growth is going to occur. It is going to be at the commercial and residential level, especially in developed nations. There are technologies that also use natural gas. This is a micro turbine that NRG is working on. It basically adopts the same technology as is used in like an APU for an aircraft. Very similar fundamental technology. These micro turbines combined with distributed solar can do some pretty interesting things in terms of payback periods. So for uh, the lighter uh, colors there, which is the commercial solar technology, we can bring in the feasibility, the levelized cost of electricity, we can cross over that point years earlier, six or seven years earlier by using a micro turbine combined with solar they're friends, they're not enemies. Okay, a couple more systems are going to walk through. Leveraging disconnects. These disconnects do exist. Whenever you change things, and even though you're holding on to the milkshake, you actually find out there are some interesting things. There are some unintended consequ consequences of the changes that occur. Um, first one of these. Shale is not just about the energy. It's about the chemicals. Now, I know this is an energy conference, but if you think chemicals and energy are distinct, I, I, you got another thing coming, and I'll show you why. So Andrew Leverus, this is a quote from in front of the Senate. And ethane that is sometimes included in LNG exports is one of the reasons why Dow Chemical were fighting the exports and were fighting some of these platforms. Now, don't get me wrong, they invested four, they're investing $4 billion in plants and equipment in Texas as well. He's, he's got some skin in the game here. But one of his biggest concerns is actually the ethane side of things. 
and that's why this one of the reasons why America's energy advantage, don't you love these catchy titles, perfect branding, right? Um, America's energy advantage was a consortium, was basically five companies going to work to try and restrict exports as much as possible. Two companies, Alcoa and Nucor, for them it's all about the energy. They could care less about the chemicals. They just want cheap power. Pretty intensive industries, right? Energy intensive industries. But the three other participants, Dow, Eastman, Huntsman, how much chemicals, how, do you think it was more about the energy or more about the chemicals in terms of the decisions that they were making and the, and the agenda they were driving? So this actually creates disconnects. Shale and the transfer between naphtha cracking to use of shale changes things, especially when you go from C1, C2, C3 and then higher in terms of chemicals. What shale gas can't do that naphtha could. Aromatics, longer chain molecules, um, synthetic rubber, higher performance polymers, biolubricants and more complex molecules, these are all out of the reach of shale using current technology today. There is nothing that exists that easily up transfers shale and what comes out of there into some of these more complex molecules. So what does this create? Well, it creates a whole bunch of molecules that are now becoming feasible using bio-based feedstocks. So the use of shale and the fact that it has a whole bunch of C1, a little bit of C2, and the, mo the tiniest bit of C3, right? What that leaves out is there are all of these higher carbon chemicals where the prices have gone through the roof. Most of the chemicals and materials companies in the world, most of the multinationals that we work with, are aggressively looking at bio-based routes to some of these higher carbon compounds. So shale has driven sustainability in an area that was entirely unintended. Shale is a good thing from a sustainability perspective because before it was naphtha. Pretty sure that was coming out of a different place than the bio-based and renewable feedstocks, right? And we're looking at a whole bunch of companies here. There's a truckload of companies that are in this space. This is one area where if I was thinking about innovation in British Columbia, I would be thinking pretty hard about how I use a bio-based resource to drive economic value into the system here. Last time I checked, there's a good amount of bio-based resource here, right? Truckloads of it. Lignin, if you've got pulp and paper, you've got a, you've got a pipeline of feedstock for bio-based materials that this can rely on. And it's not just bio-based materials, there's also biofuel capacity that's going in. I'm not talking about that corn garbage, I'm not talking about sort of the whole fuel versus food thing. Believe me, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. But these are the projected growth rates for different types of biofuel that are out there that are also mandated. So we've got ethanol, we've got biodiesel, and we've got this little sliver of other that is yellow in there. We've got mandates that are, interestingly, not Canadian listed, so these are the, uh, the Americas ones that, uh, that we know of in terms of where we are, what the fuel is, what the mandate target is, what the year of that mandate is, but interestingly, what is the domestic production capacity that we have projected for that mandated year as of today, All right? So that's, that's the US or the, the America situation. Um, we also looked at it from an Asia perspective and a European perspective as well. But here's what you end up with. There are parts of the world that have a massive imbalance between what the mandate says they should adopt and what their projected capacity is. So that dark, dark blue area. In those areas, there is more than a 1,000 million gallon per year shortfall of biofuel capacity in those countries, in the United States as well as in India. So if I'm looking at that US thing and I'm sitting on a truckload of biomass, and I'm trying to think of ways to drive more business and more trade into my province, just so happens you're, you're kind of proximate to two parts of that puzzle, you sit in a pretty nice spot, that is opportunity. So there's a whole bunch of work that can go into the sustainability area that's partially about energy, but partially about materials. And again, shale drives a lot of this behavior and a lot of this change. So you think shale's an enemy, or you think it's a friend? You can actually work both ways. You can make money from shale, and if you're smart, you can make money from the impact of shale as well, the side effects of shale. Staying in reality, I got three pages, and now I'm done, Brent. I promise. Um, so, energy. Aspirations of disruptive technology are a crock, right? Disruption is not real in the energy space and the time frames that you think it is and that a venture capitalist claims exist. It does not exist. So. You can go all you want into electric vehicles and aspirations of all this massive change. Sorry. Throw your billions into it and what you'll end up with is a mild hybrid and a micro hybrid. That's reality. 
So you can throw billions at a big problem and end up at the incremental problems that are easy to adopt. That is a pragmatic approach to get to the end game and to bridge to where we need to get to because we're not going to drop the milkshake. Not anytime soon. So, we want to go with this. We want to see all this massive growth, the substantial change, S curves, we're going to throw billions of dollars and what you actually end up with this, right? You end up with a whole bunch of flat. What would be more sensible here and what would be more sensible from an innovation perspective, from a policy perspective, is instead of going after the big, big nut, you've got to look at two things. How do we not drop the milkshake? And what are the, what, I guess, what are the technologies and what are the opportunities that allow us to grow? Remember, we are human. We're designed to be safe first, and then we're designed to grow second. And if you ignore our human nature, you're making a mistake. So we've got to sum these things up. Find the technologies that allow us to not drop the milkshake and grow the milkshake. And this will occur not through one single disruption, but a whole series of individual disruptions that we have to work towards and realising that any dollar spent in the wrong place and any dollar that does not resolve and move, result in moving the needle is a dollar that was wasted. So, conclusions. Tangibility of threat correlates with response. Without an immediate threat, growth conquers all. Deal with it. It's who we are. It's who we've been trained to be over millennia. Safety first, growth second. And energy infrastructure, we'll, we will pay we will pay to avoid being disrupted. Don't ask us to pay to be disrupted. We will laugh you out of the room. Efficiency-driven offerings. They find the lowest barrier to adoption. We heard on, from that on the, on the building side, from the previous panel. I've given you examples on the transportation side. I, can give, I could roll you through a, just a truckload of examples where efficiency wins provided it doesn't cause disruption to the end user. And last but not least, innovation must integrate with reality. Dream all you want, I'm right there with you, but realise that at some point in time, you've got to bring it back to reality. And you've got to leverage reality in order to get it accepted. All right. Thanks for your time. I'm looking forward to the panel this afternoon. I, I hope I get questions. Thanks, Brent. Chris, great talk, and uh, you know it, it validates.